Hi everyone, it's Rosa Mendez, uh, DEC's Environmental Justice Director. We are going to get started. I'm just helping a few of our panelists with some technical issues and we will try to get going in about a minute. Okay, great. Looks like everyone or almost everyone is on, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning again. My name is Rosa Mendez and I'm DEC's Environmental Justice Director. We are here for our Climate Justice Working Group meeting and today, uh, just a reminder for meeting procedures, we ask that everyone stay on mute when you're not speaking. And if you are here as a working group member, we encourage you to use video so that we can all see each other. Uh, today we have Alex working with us on the slides. Thank you very much, Alex. If you can move to the next slide, please. Great, and what I'll do, uh, because we have with us today from California a few representatives who are going to talk to us about their experience with the California disadvantaged communities definition and the process related to that. But what I'll do so that we all know who's on the call is I'll run through our working group members list and I'll ask each of you when I call on you to introduce yourself very quickly, your name and who you're with. So we'll start with who I can see on the screen, Abigail. Am I just supposed to say I'm here? Is that all I'm supposed to do? Yeah, just introduce yourself, your name, your organization. Oh, I'm, I'm from the Climate Solutions Accelerator for Dennis and Finger Lakes region, and I probably will keep myself off on video today since I'm in a public space. Thanks. And Amy? Hi, Amy Klein from Capital Roots in the Capital Region. Thank you. And Elizabeth? Uh, Buena Bia, Elizabeth Jan Pierre with Uprose in Brooklyn, Sunset Park. And next, I see Eddie. 
Uh, good morning, all. Eddie Bautista, New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Good morning. We scroll over a bit. Jerry. All right, good morning, folks. Jerry Bly with the Adirondack North Country Association based in Saranac Lake, New York. I just want to say thank you to the California reps for being on the call this morning as well. Next up, I see Rawa. Good morning, everyone. Rawa Gurmatsian, she, her pronouns with Push Buffalo. And Sono. Hi, everyone. Sonal Jessel um, with We Act for Environmental Justice based in New York City and she, her pronouns. Mary Beth. Good morning, everyone. Mary Beth McEwen with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Oneida County. And do we have Donathan? I don't think I see him. Great. Um, Joe, are you on? Yes, hello everybody. This is Joe McNerney with the New York State Department of Labor. And Neil. Yep. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Neil from the New York State Department of Health. Hey, thank you. And Chris, were you able to jump on? I know you were running a few minutes late. All right, so Chris Cole will join us in a few minutes. Uh, next. Our team from Illum, will you introduce yourselves? Good morning. This is Alex Dunn from Illum Advising. And this is Amanda Dwelly from Illum Advising. Great, thank you. All right. And uh, we also have a few people from DEC joining us as well uh, to help out with the logistics and uh, they are Jordan Gogler, and I also see that Jared Snyder is joining us today. So thank you both for joining us. Moving on, Alex, if you can run us to the next slide, please. This is our agenda today. Again, we're going to quickly move into our discussion with the California representatives because we have them for the top half of the meeting. And then we'll go quickly through our business items. And then we'll have an update on our data efforts from Alex. So Alex, if you can move us to the next slide. All right, so I'm happy to see that we have Yana Garcia, Marta Arguello, and Diane Takvorian with us today. And so what I'll do, ladies, is I'll turn over to you for a quick introduction and we'll start with Yana. Sure, hi, good morning. Um, Pleasure to be here with all of you virtually. Um, my name is Yana Garcia. I am. I currently serve as the Deputy Secretary for Environmental Justice, Tribal Affairs, and California-Mexico Border Relations at the California Environmental Protection Agency. Um, looking forward to the discussion today about some of the ways in which we've um, designated disadvantaged communities through um, our work here in the state of California and really um, Honored to be here with my fellow California guests who are really experts um, in this field far more than I am. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And Martha. Okay, well, Martha, you might be on mute if you're trying to introduce yourself. You all missed my great introduction. <laughs> uh, Martha Lina Arguello, uh, the Executive Director of Physicians for Social Responsibility Los Angeles. And our chapter uh, has been deeply committed for over 20 years now of bringing the credible voice of physicians to support the powerful voices of communities uh, confronting pollution, poverty, and racism and have worked for many years around uh, bringing science and uh, the public health tools to policymaking. Uh, so it was around when they first developed uh, the concept of uh, the cumulative impacts assessment tools and others. And so I'm, I'm happy to be here and good to see some wonderful friends. Great, thank you. And next we have Diane. Good morning. Can you hear me? I'll just yes. check before I rattle on. Um, 
Good morning, everyone. It's great to uh, be with you all, uh, our New York allies and um, brothers and sisters from um, from New York and also our California friends uh, and allies. Diane Tekvorian with Environmental Health Coalition. Uh, we are a uh, environmental justice organization, just celebrated our 40th anniversary and Elizabeth was with us for that. So we uh, really appreciate it her uh, coming out uh, virtually um, to, to be with us. We are a, uh, as I said, an environmental justice organization by national. We have offices in San Diego, National City, and in Colonia Chilpancingo in Tijuana. So um, we are active in international trade issues and um, uh, climate pollution issues. We're also a member of the California Environmental Justice Alliance, um, as is PSR. Um, and uh, Marta and I have probably a longer uh, history. I don't know if we have a longer memory. <laughs> we'll see if our memories line up uh, about the history of the definition of uh, environmental justice and disadvantaged communities in, um, in California. So it's uh, uh, really a great honor to be with you all and to be asked to, to talk with you about this. Great, thank you. And thank all three of you for being here. I see that Chris Cole has joined us. So I'll turn over to him for his introduction and to take us away with our uh, California Q&A with our California representatives, Chris. Hi, Rosa, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Chris Cole from NYSERDA. I'm the director for the Energy Affordability and Equity work at NYSERDA. Um, and uh, thank you all, you know, for to the California folks for, for joining us and, and spending a little bit of time, you know, helping us kind of, you know, better understand the, the California um, dynamic um, when it comes to kind of addressing the, the environmental justice um, issues through the, 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 the California um, uh, climate investments. And um, we're really interested in, in better understanding kind of just what the, you know, what, what the uh, discussions um, and in considerations, you know, that the California team has, has had in kind of advancing this work. Um, we, we know that, you know, the, the California model is a bit different than, you know, kind of what we're kind of working with in, in New York State. Um, however, we're hoping that, you know, there's um, some lessons learned and some you know, considerations that, you know, you all would be able to, you know, kind of impart, um, you know, for, for, uh, for, for our benefit today. So we, we appreciate your, your time and um, and and uh, the, the conversation that we're going to have. Um, so, um, Rosa, in terms of the um, kind of the flow, I, I think we have um, some of our um, climate justice working group members had some questions uh, for the, the California team. Should we just start with those? Um, sure. That works. Okay, so, so I know some of you had questions that you wanted to ask and, you know, happy to turn the floor over to working group members to ask their questions. So maybe what we could do is if um, our working group members have any um, uh, ha an initial questions for the California team, um, Eddie looks like he has hand we up. can unmute. Uh, was Chris, the... I was saying Eddie, Eddie has his hand up, I think. I saw his hand up. Hey, good morning, folks. Can you hear me? Hey, Eddie. Hi. Um, I, I actually have multiple questions, but I'm, I'm, I, I promise some of my fellow working group members I won't be obnoxious uh, and get all giddy because our, our, our family from California has joined us today. Um, but uh, maybe I'll uh, kick off uh, with a couple. And, and I'm sure that some of my colleagues uh, are going to have some of the same questions. Uh, but first off, I just wanted to, again, thank you all. Uh, we know it's it's mad early, I think, where you all are calling in from. So uh, uh, we, we really deeply appreciate you making the time. Um, let, let me just rattle off the, the, the couple of questions, and, and, and I'm sure others will have uh, additional ones. But I, I think what we initially wanted, uh, what would be wonderful to hear, is how did the government regulators and community work together to, to arrive at, at at the ultimate um, enviro screen and any lessons learned about uh, how that partnership evolved and um, you know and we'd really love to hear from the community and 
how you all experienced. Uh, so it's it's from your different perspectives. How did you how did you all experience and and appreciate the uh, the process? The second question I had is one that we have been um, several of us have raised a few times, uh, and I don't I don't believe we have an answer yet. Um, which is how how did how did California deal with uh, the inclusion of indigenous communities um, in 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 the EnviroScreen development specifically, uh, because part, part of what's troubling some of us here is that um, there hasn't been indigenous engagement in, I don't believe in any of the working groups that have come together um, to implement the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. But, you know, I, I can't, you know, I, I can't speak for the other committees, but I know in this one, uh, the ability to be able to properly um, identify and and ensure that indigenous communities are part of the disadvantaged community, um, not just definition, but but the resources hopefully that will flow from that is critically important to us. And we really would love to get some direction. I'll stop there because I have other questions and I'm sure others do too. But again, um, thank you all and, and welcome and, and looking forward to the conversation. So, uh, if if Marta and Jana are okay, uh, I can give a little background on the um, California Environmental Justice uh, Advisory Committee uh, process, and then uh, Marta can take it from there um, <laughs> if that would help. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. We didn't plan this, so we're yep. Uh, okay. <laughs> so in the late nineties. Um, the California, as I'm sure you know, uh, adopted their environmental justice agenda or a definition, which essentially mirrored the federal um, definition and created this California Environmental Justice Advisory Committee, which uh, Marta and I were active with, and I had the opportunity to co-chair. And that group met for a couple of years. Um, it was really the first opportunity in California to hear from um, environmental justice communities, to hear what their issues were, and to discuss uh, the lack <laughs> of responsiveness on the part of California government. And uh, there's long stories to tell about, um, I think, all of the information that came from that and the heartfelt testimony from our communities uh, that were being ignored in terms of hazardous waste sites, pesticide uh, spraying and poisoning um, uh, industries that were spewing toxics into our communities, discriminatory land use, all of these issues came up and the um, committee after two years of hearings came uh, with 115, I think, recommendations uh, for changes that should be made. Um, but there, the, one, the top uh, recommendation was to create a cumulative um, impact uh, system. And so that occurred in 2004, and Cal Virus Screen was introduced uh, Yana's going to correct me on this, on, in 2011 or 12, right? So it took a long time uh, for that system to, to develop. And uh, there were lots of public meetings um, related to, to the development of Cal and Screen, And there's still debate related to uh, the criteria and how it, uh, uh, you know, how it unfolds for all of our communities. And, and I would say that, uh, there isn't complete satisfaction across the board and uh, in regards to how communities are represented. But for a large part, uh, at least my view is, um, we have a pretty good representation of where uh, pollution is the worst and um, it combines other uh, social determinants of health as well as um, social factors um, that we really need to keep um, keep in mind. So, as it was evolving, um, SEHA developed a Green Zones campaign um, whose intention was to utilize that map um, to say that these were the communities where investments should occur. Um, and that's what happened over a period of years, and Cal Virus Green was integrated into 
think over 15 pieces of legislation um, that became law uh, over uh, and directed investment to occur in those communities. So, you know, this isn't a perfect system and uh, I think it would benefit from much more additional discussion at the local level. But in my mind, it set the framework uh, for the criteria that are important to evaluate um, from uh, pollution factors to uh, uh, to economic uh, issues um, to housing. Uh, this year, they incorporated uh, housing in terms of lead um, poisoning in homes, uh, which is the first time they've done that. And I know Environmental Health Coalition requested that from the beginning. Um, and so that's just evolved. And there's and for us, and I'll close with this, the, the representation of pollution on the U.S.-Mexico border is not sufficient. We have a ton of pollution because it is a port of entry and we have thousands of trucks traveling back and forth every day. Um, that's getting better um, as a result of monitoring um, on the border, but it's not nearly representative of, of what the true impact is. So, you know, so it's a framework of a system, um, I think, that it is is useful for y'all to think about using as a model, but uh, there's there's plenty that we can do to improve it. Yeah, there's not a lot I would add. Am I muted? No, there's not a lot I would add other than, you know, at that time the the debate was, you know, and how permitting and how many of the decisions were being made were not taking into account. The, the, the lived experience, the way we live pollution, we don't live it 1 facility at a time, 1 chemical at a time, 1 process at a time, 1 manufacturer at a time. We live with the cumulative impacts of the land use and other decisions that get made. Right? And so Cal Enviro screen, well, the cumulative impacts tool that we demanded get created was separate and apart from a cap and trade program or any other program. And the green zones was a way of bringing that tool into actually decision making, which has been the, a bigger challenge. And I, I would agree, you know, that there is from a health perspective and from the perspective of communities, um, having more granular data on health outcomes. So I don't know how your state does and how your city does in terms of collecting data, but we don't have a we we did not have good health data endpoints. We have respiratory risk, reproductive risk, and I believe cancer risk. And not included race. So there's a lot of things that got left out that are really important. And that much of that was done through a, a so that stakeholder process where we came up with the recommendations ended. And I will add that the, the rec the two big recommendations was to develop a cumulative impacts tool and for Cal EPA to develop to develop a precautionary approach to policy making and permitting, right? Which says Prevention is better than, you know, it's better to prevent. You have to have a deep stakeholder process. You have to ask the question, is there a better alternative? Is this necessary? And is it uh, including communities in the decisions, right? The right to decide. Those are real important elements of precaution. We thought those two tools as policy tools, one the data tool and the other the policy tool would actually get us to a place where we could start, prevent, you know, Stopping the harm and then fixing the harm that's been done. Um, and so, and then you asked about stakeholder process. And there were a lot of meetings. I will say there was a lot of meetings. And I will be honest, by that time, I was so fed up with the, with them that I didn't attend the meetings. So many of, but there were many, many other folks because I just thought they're never going to do this. And why they finally finished it was now that they had now as the cap and trade program evolved in California. And we continue to say, this is a false solution. This is not going to do well. We don't want our more harm done to our communities. Then this overlay came, like, we'll make investments into your communities. And so, uh, again, not, not, not the way we wanted, uh, but the tool is important and we've been able to use it in a number of ways, right? As an advocacy tool. Because the data is imperfect, it's 19 measures of community vulnerability, not including race. So we actually in LA, as part of our green zones, did um, much more deeper dive into about five census tracts, working with community organizations, and we went out and verified all the publicly available data on permits and facilities. And we found in those five 
uh, census tracts that there were at least 150 facilities that didn't exist anywhere. So I think, you know, Diane's point to the lack of data, but communities have actually had to engage and develop our, uh, our capacity around community data collection and ground truthing. And that's actually been a really useful tool in so what I call micro targeting industries that we need to figure out how to do just transition work with. Are there ways that we can work with some of those industries because our uncles and aunts and cousins and brothers work there that we can actually make those safer for the workers. So it, and we also took, and I wish I could show the screen, <laughs> but I can't. We also have used Cal Enviro screen uh, to show the impacts of COVID. So we were able to map COVID cases, overlay them over Cal Enviro screen, and it's what it verified our reality. Um, because often we have to verify that things are true, uh, that low income communities, communities overburdened with pollution were also the same communities being overburdened and decimated by COVID. So there's many ways to use the tool to make the case, but unless it gets into permitting, right? Where you've got 29 auto body shops and, you know, somebody has to be able to say no to the 30th, right? And that's what we wanted that tool to be used for. I would just add, I think Thank that was you, really thorough, both Diane and Martha, there's not too much to add, but I did wanna make sure to get to your question about um, indigenous communities. Um, first, just to just to address a couple of things that Diane and Martha said, um, you know, really hit the nail on the head that the impetus truly, I think from the government side to get, um, unfortunately to get the, the, the um, tool off the ground in the end was to really address some of the investments from the cap and trade program, which um, really put our environmental justice stakeholders, community residents, um, and our communities in a, in an, I think it's fair to characterize as an un, unfair position um, because this was a tool that was developed for, I think a different vision and a different purpose. Um, that said, it has, of course, been used to focus um, a significant amount of investment from the cap and trade program now. Um, and I'd say the community process is ongoing. Um, it was a long community process to get it, get the tool developed, to get it out, get those recommendations out in the early 2000s, as Diane mentioned. And now every time we update the tool and even during times in which we're not updating the tool, there's ongoing input. Um, that the state is is consistently um, soliciting to understand what types of investments might be better um, suited for communities, what types of best practices we should be looking at for these investments, um, what other uses of Cal and Bioscreen we should be thinking about. It is um, somewhat being used in some land use decisions now locally um, through this iterative process of, of additional legislation that's developed over the past several years. Um, so I'd say it's it's ever evolving. Um, I do think that the precise way in which um, it was envisioned to be used for permitting decisions, for decisions around mitigation measures, for decisions to not issue permits um, in the first place, to take, as Martha just described, the precautionary approach, um, we have yet to see that happen. Um, so thank you for, for that um, much more informed uh, history. I was not around during the time that Cal and Virus being um, developed. So um, they're much better to, to describe that. Um, on the point of indigenous communities, unfortunately, we indigenous communities, tribal communities, California federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes are not explicitly um, identified as such in Cal and Viro screen currently. Um, we capture the broad breadth of indigenous communities um, as in binational indigenous communities um, through various um, factors that are used to identify vulnerable communities generally, um, but we do not use Cal and Viro screen for our California federally recognized tribes. Um, I'm happy to talk about that more. That's a little bit of a longer conversation from the data side. Um, there are several reasons why the data, because Cal and Viro screen is a statewide screening tool and uses the census tract as the as the the scale for for comparison um, and uses data from um, county sources, um, state level sources, in addition to federal sources. Um, 
the idea is that the tribal sources of data are not consistent enough to be able to capture the same type of screening that the rest of the state um, can reflect. I think what we've leaned toward in the investments um, context is actually establishing specific set aside pots of money that are available to tribes. So rather than putting um, tribes in the same uh, category as everyone else for the, the funding that is focused in disadvantaged communities or not, really understanding that we need a separate pot of funding that is available to our tribal communities, our, our California tribes. Um, it doesn't address the data though. And I think there are a lot of ways in which we need to still be able to understand the particular burdens and vulnerabilities that are facing um, California tribes in our state. Many of those are housed at the federal level. So in some ways, um, the development of a federal um, kind of analog to Cal and Biro screen and would be really helpful in terms of identifying relative disadvantage in, in tribal communities in California. Yana, can I just ask one follow up question? Thank you for that. Um, it, uh, what, how do you incorporate unrecognized nations and tribes? Is there an effort to do that? So, not explicitly. Um, we don't have an explicit way to capture, um, say, indigenous communities. One of the ways that we've captured um, indigenous and immigrant communities is through um, identifying linguistically isolated communities and people. That would be the closest way that we're able to capture that. Um, that does not account for the hundreds of thousands of, of um, members of tribes of, uh, in other parts of the nation that have come to California and that reside in California. Um, and so we don't have anything that explicitly captures Native American people from this country. Thank you. In part, because we don't, we don't track race as an indicator, as Martha mentioned, which I also think is really critical to keep in mind in terms of lessons learned. Um, I think it's been, it's part of the, um, it's, it's like a double edged sword, the fortunate and unfortunate nature of using the tool for investments. Um, as I'm sure you all are familiar with, um, there are a lot of arguments made for the expenditure of public dollars based on race. The impression of focusing investment dollars based on race is created when race is the indicator. That's kind of how it's been for us in California. We are trying to chip away at that um, and consistently when we update the tool as we just recently did um, in February uh, by, by releasing data about the racial demographics of the highest scoring census tracts across the board and showing it, you know, it's not an indicator, but we're showing it as um, an informational tool, a comparative tool. So you can look at race demographic data overlaid with the highest scoring census tracts, which unfortunately it's not gonna surprise us that they're overwhelmingly, if not exclusively communities of color, um, including black, um, Latinx and, and indigenous communities and migrant communities. So. It's still, it's, it, that's a lesson learned. <laughs> Thanks, Yana. The, we, we have a few other questions, it looks like, from, from other working group members. Um, we've got Jared, Abby, and Rawa up next. And I think, Eddie, you might have had a couple of other questions. So maybe we could start with Jared. All right, yeah, I think it was addressed, but I'll ask it again. Um, the other question was, how has the investments played out on the ground? And, you know, what is your assessment of its effectiveness and the process by which it was to make those investments? Thank you. Um, I wanted to kind of answer Jared's uh, question by uh, maybe providing uh, a little bit more uh, context of you know, the Cal and Viro screen was initially intended to identify communities that were most impacted. And there's lots of discussion about how well that was done. And I think the issue of race is critical here and appreciate, I think, Yana's good work to continue to put it out there and um, create a way that we can look at 
uh, race related to where the impacted communities are. But I would say that one of the things that's important um, is that if you do it using census tracts, then you have census data that you can always apply if the state were to decide that they uh, weren't able to use or willing to use race um, as an indicator. So I think that's been an important factor. And, and there's other census information that can be applied when you use census tracts. So I think that's kind of a smart, um, uh, nerdy uh, thing that we'd want to <laughs> be thinking about. Um, the other thing to say is that there's uh, lots of other uh, laws and regulations that utilize Cal Enviro Screen. So when you ask the question, Jared, of how does it work on the ground, you know, it it isn't one thing. Um, and so I guess uh, the what I would take away is that if the framework for identification of the most impacted communities is solid, then you can build a series of uh, legislative pieces that go with it to uh, attack the problems that are most important in your communities and to ensure that those communities that are identified as impacted are getting the benefit. So, you know, we have like this um, transformative climate communities program that um, focuses in, it has to use Cal Enviro Screen as the, as the way to indicate which communities would get that benefit. Um, I sit on the California Air Resources Board and there's all this incentive funding for um, transitioning heavy duty trucks to uh, zero emission. And there is a certain percentage that have to be benefiting um, disadvantaged communities. And there's a bunch of other uh, programs that do that. So uh, it kind of works as the framework in that way. And uh, so it, it's not Cal Enviro Screen that's having that impact so much as the other laws that you build around it. And I, I, there's a couple questions in the chat that are really interesting and important. Yep. And I, I would preface by saying, um, this, you know, there's the state level laws that do this, right? But then there's the processes and procedures that define how that's going to be implemented. And that's key. Uh, you know, what was the process for defining who qualifies investments in DAC? I mean, those those have been really central questions. And central to that is who decides, not so much who's a DAC, but how will that money be invested, uh, and 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 who. So at this, and it's important to note that at the same time that this program was growing, a lot of the air regulatory agencies, as this money came in sort of shifted their focus from regulating to administering programs to figuring out how to move this money out. And so once that starts to happen, the part about, oh, you're supposed to reduce air and regulate the air got a little bit lost and fuzzy. And we've been, you know, Diane being on the air board is part of our fight to bring that back to the board, right? She's you know, having an environmental justice voice that said at the end of the day you gotta reduce emissions. Uh, is important, you know, and in in so that part, and then the the role that community plays in decision making is also really critical. We've actually used the uh, Cal Enviro screen in the city of Los Angeles when we created our climate emergency mobilization office, which uh, created a you know commission, and people on uh, the only ones who serve on the commission are people from the disadvantaged communities, and the other. Uh, Part of it has been is that it is also in a weird way helped build our movement on the ground as we needed to work with housing folks. We needed to work with the lots of the communities who are working on displacement and gentrification so that we would not have green gentrification, right? Because uh, what we often say is if you build on existing inequality, if you don't do it with a really strong justice focus where communities have a right to decide, you actually deepen the inequality. And so you can be saying, I've just, you know, spent $3 million in your community. And I'm like, where is it? Oh, you gave it to Coca-Cola. <laughs> do, do what? So those are the things you don't want to do. Uh, and you do have to guard against displacement and gentrification because of, of the profound vulnerability of our communities. Uh, and right now, in particular, with you know, 
yeah, right now in, in the light of COVID and what it's done uh, to destabilize people in their own homes because of rent. So I think all of those things are really important in building those community participation and tools for community decision making, constantly asking yourselves, even when you think you're doing it, are you centering on justice? Are you centering on the most vulnerable? Are you asking the question that the tool gives you, right? These are the overburdened communities. How is my policy going to make sure that they don't bear more burdens and actually benefit, right? Those, those are policy questions and political questions and the tools just force you to see it visually, right? You have to look at the map uh, and sit with what that means. Thank you, Marta. Um, Abby, super Abby, Abby, do you have this. other? Oh. oh, sorry, Anna. No, just a very quick point. Um, is, uh, you know, both Diane and, and Martha hit on this, but for the question about the strategy um, resulting in unintended negative consequences, for example, displacement, um, absolutely to all of Martha's points. And there's um, the Transformative Climate Communities Program that Diane was describing has, I think, what are the best um kind of guidelines and best practices but guidelines like strong guidelines for investment dollars um having to accompany um anti-displacement protections implemented for residents and businesses um and these are for large-scale investments um in in housing and transportation um, that come from our greenhouse gas reduction fund. And so I just encourage um, if, if folks are looking for a way, particularly on the government side, I mean, I, I just wanna emphasize like this is our responsibility as government agencies to ensure that these dollars do not lead to displacement, right? Um, and so a lot of that for my fellow government folks on here or to push um, for um, some of these best practices to be adopted at the, at the state government level, um, you may want to take a look at those as as potential um, best practices that you could alter, tweak, however you see fit. Thanks, Yana. Um, Abby, do you have other questions that you'd like to ask since you're you're next up in the queue? Um, well, I think most of my questions have been answered, and I appreciate those answers. Thank you very much. I guess I would just follow on two points. I, if you have any kind of maybe recommendations on in the definition itself, where's, and I heard loud and clear from you guys, like getting race in there, that's important. Are there any other kind of, how do we guard against the possible side effects through the development of the definition? And then the other piece of that is about um, rural residents and I'm thinking, you know, migrant farm workers, I, you know, and I don't know how you've maybe made sure that where, where do they fit, you know, where, where a census tract might not work as well. Uh, I, I think we're still having those debates and, you know, as part of the California Environmental Justice Alliance, we are actually often hearing from our, you know, our allies who are in rural areas about the limitations. So there's always a constant, you know, engagement to the next iteration of it to be better. Uh, you know, tweaks around ensuring, you know, we've used it as part of uh, ensuring that general plans have an EJ element. So there's this sort of disbursement of the idea of cumulative impact and being able to assess uh, who's in, in a, you know, in a disadvantaged community. So, um, but those continue to be challenges, right? You know, in Made, you know, this is just off the top of my head because I didn't really think about this, but using both qualitative and quantitative data, wait, waiting, um, I always say absence of data does not mean proof of safety, and here absence of data does not mean proof of having justice, right, or equity in their lives, in their communities. So, you know that in rural areas, there's less people, so you do some sort of, you know, I'm sure an MPH and a, somebody else could figure it out uh, how to weight those things. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, inherently, um, 
Cal Enviro Screen is at the end of the day a geographically focused tool. It does look at geographic areas, and I think there's a lot that is um, gained through that and a lot that is lost, um, including how to really understand the types of burdens and vulnerabilities when it comes to um, facing the threat and real impacts of climate change, facing um, the impact of pollution um, to our our migrant communities, our our communities that that move um, uh, and don't um, really adhere to one census tract at a time, um, and namely that is largely agricultural workers, um, but certainly other types of of um, hospitality workers, um, domestic workers, etc. Um, so that is, to Martha's point, still something that we don't capture in the, we don't capture well in the tool. Um, for rural communities, um, again, that's that's also something that we've struggled with. That the population factors have had to be tweaked over time to ensure that we're not um, that we are not over prioritizing places with heavier populations. So we've had to really look at that from a, from a data standpoint. Um, we also get a lot of pushback about the role that um, air pollution data plays um, in driving Calvin virus outcomes and scores, because in some rural areas, there may not be, I mean, there are large exceptions for us in California and the San Joaquin Valley for various reasons. There is severe, there are severe air quality challenges. The San Joaquin Valley has some of the worst air quality in the world, actually. So um, that's a big broad swath of rural areas um, that is that are actually captured in Cal and Bioscreen because of the focus on air pollution. But um, we've had to really look at more refined ways to look at drinking water um, burdens and how that's affecting rural communities that may not come up as the highest scoring census tracts um, and other ways to really capture rural disadvantage. I wanted just you, to, Yana, add to what Yana and Martha said about that I think something important that you may want to think about as you're developing um, both the definitions as well as the process, and that is that the precursor to Cal and Viroscreen and basically the scientists uh, within the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment um, really working this uh, this tool um, was uh, Manuel Pastor and Rachel Rachel Morello Froch. Um, putting together the environmental justice screening model in which, um, and Jim Sad, uh, who put together the data and then did a ground truthing project. So many of us in communities got the data and were able to actually walk the data around the neighborhoods. And um, mm -hmm. they really changed the way they, um, they utilized the data based on um, community input in that way. So we got maps, we got data, the community members changed them to say, yeah, no, the school's not here, it's over there, and it's right next to the industry or whatever the data was. So I think for whatever community, um, it's really important to have a ground truthing element. And that has not continued. Um, in uh, quite the same way, although Yano's right, there's still a fairly robust way that uh, the state brings the information to the community. But I would highly recommend um, that you try to utilize a ground truthing method in as you develop this tool. Thanks, Diane. Yeah. And um, just a, a time check, if um, if I if I can. I know we had initially asked our friends from California to um, to join us for an hour. Um, is it possible for Marta, Diane, Yana, for, for you to stay on a little bit longer if we can continue this conversation for another half an hour or so? Is that possible? I would love to. I unfortunately have to leave at nine, but I'm leaving you with the better efforts in this anyway, and I'm happy to um, answer any follow-up questions. Okay, well, thank I, you, Yana. I, I and, can. And, Great. I can only Thank stay you. till ten after because I have a nine fifteen. So, okay, <laughs> appreciate that, Diane. So let's let's get to it then. Um, and maybe since Yana does have to leave in seven minutes, um, I know Rawa, you had a question. Sonal and Eddie are, are also up next. Um, but any any follow up questions for for Yana before before she has to leave? Yeah, I had and one follow up we'll... question for Yana. <laughs> yep, go go ahead, Rawa. <laughs> 
first of all, there's not enough time to tell to tell y'all how grateful I am for this really important conversation and all the incredible knowledge that y'all bring to this and experience. Thank you so much. Uh, my question to Yana in particular to indigenous communities is how did you make a decision on how much funds to set aside? Like, was there a tool or what did you use to put those funds to the side? Hopefully we have a different process, obviously, but if, you know, it definitely beats a blank. Yana, you're muted. So sorry. <laughs> I just started talking um, and I, I also wanted to start and probably end by saying, um, you know, it's, it's such an honor for us to be with all of you and just recognize the amazing work that you all do day in and day out. And just, this is an awesome space. Anyway, have us back whenever you want. You're welcome to call me back in whenever you'd like. Um, uh, so the set asides for tribes have been um, uh, kind of issue area and um, and agency by agency. So our, our Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Commission joined together to hold a series of um, listening sessions in tribal communities in on tribal lands to understand the energy need, um, both from a research standpoint and infrastructure investment standpoint in um, affecting tribes and, and in tribal communities. And landed on, I think it was 250 million um, in grant monies for um, tribal communities. Don't quote me on the amount. I'm happy to follow up. I, I can't remember if that's what we landed on um, for grants to tribes um, that then was put out in a solicitation and um, we awarded, I think, like 10 out of the 12 grants that, that are applications that that came in. Um, so that was one example. The Air Resources Board is um, developing still what their set aside might be um, and what that might look like. They award um, what are called community air grants, um, which is through a, a process that Diane and, and Martha can also tell you more about um, and to implement a community air protection bill that, that was passed several years ago in 2017. Um, and those grants are available to tribes and tribal communities. We have various grant programs, whether they're through um, the greenhouse gas reduction fund or other well, other sources of funding that are obviously available to tribes. But for the set asides, I'd say the way that agencies have approached it so far has been to have a series of you know listening sessions and understanding what the extent of the need is, and then of course going back and obviously crunching numbers and understanding what is feasible to award. And that's not counting loans. There are also several loans um, loan opportunities that that should also be explored. Thanks, Yana. R Rawa, did you have any any follow-ups for Yana? No, I don't. Great. Um, uh, so we have two more minutes left with Yana. A any other questions for, for her before she leaves? I do. Hello? Any? We can hear you. Hi. So, um, Yana, one of, the, one of the questions we have is, how are investments and their corresponding mandated percentages guided for you guys? Uh, New York's law calls for commitments of 35 to 40 percent clean energy funding uh, to be um, of clean energy funding benefits to uh, be dedicated for uh, disadvantaged communities as opposed to direct funding which makes the accountability and transparency harder, right? Both for government and us. How, how have you guys grappled with, with, with your percentage mandates and, and making sure that, that you're living up to the uh, intent of, of, of your laws? Oh, interesting. Um, um, so we have both within and benefiting targets. So dollars that have to go into the community and benefit those com that community, that community. And we have also added to that um, low income designation. So in addition to the disadvantaged communities um, identified through Cal and Screen, we also have an additional um, percentage threshold that has to be um, spent in and benefiting low income communities. I say the legislature has given us a lot of pretty explicit direction, um, which is fortunate. Um, the tracking system that we use to make sure that the dollars are actually going to the right place is super complicated and literally is staffed by 
well over 200 people in the bureaucracy machine. <laughs> so I, I would, I would say that um, the the this team of you know over 200 people um, they track the greenhouse gas emission reductions associated with every dollar spent. Um, and they track the places in which the dollars are spent and other what are called co-benefits, which include all of the benefits that um, that are in our Air Resources Board's guidelines um, for particular communities. But um, I'd be happy to have a and put you in touch with people who can have a more nuanced conversation about what that looks like um, in terms of the nuts and bolts. But to keep it brief, it it entails a lot of bureaucratic investment and bureaucratic growth <laughs> i'd say it doesn't necessarily have to i think what's missing actually is more um to Martha's point on democratizing our granting and investment and contracting process what it frankly is missing is more of a, a ground truthing we do a lot of workshopping and information dissemination in our communities but I think we can really improve the ability for community residents and participants in the areas where we are investing our dollars, actually having a direct say in how those dollars are spent. Was it successful? What could have been done better? What do they want to see the next time, et cetera? So that I think we can really improve. Thank you. Does that help answer your question? Okay, cool. Great. Yeah, I, I, can't, I, I can't stress enough the importance of having a really well ground truth and community driven and owned process for making some of these decisions. Right? You know, I, I do a lot of work in South LA in the historic community of Watts. I was at a climate reality training speaking and a woman came up to me and she's like so happy she's working in Watts and I'm like, you know, she was not a black woman. Uh, and I'm like, oh, okay. And I, I was just surprised. And then I end up finding out that in Watts, how is that possible, right? It is a historic African American community. Uh, also now, you know, Black and Latino, some of the largest population of Indigenous people from the the rest of the Americas. But yet they are giving funds to groups who are not rooted there, right? And then those right. groups are doling out little tiny amounts to the groups right. there. So you, you perpetuate a cycle of, of disinvestment in poverty and the assumption that we don't know how to do things for our, for our own selves, which is really problematic, right? So uh, in Los Angeles, we actually, this office that we created, we were really conscious that we wanted all those investment dollars to get to, that come to Los Angeles to have an equity screen. We are actually trying to develop a benefits and burdens analysis. And because we're like, we don't want any more projects that are harmful to our communities. We don't want these monies going to false solutions. We don't want these funds extending the life of gas plants, right? And so, uh, and so yeah, those are just like really, really important things to keep in mind. Uh, and more democracy is always better, right? Empowering communities to decide about where this money goes is transformative, not, you know, because that's what we want. We want things that are, because the things, you know, they have to be transformative. And this tool was transformative, but it requires such much more to actually make it, you know, it's still just a hammer. I'd love to add to that to say, you know, one of the largest places that um, these dollars are going from the cap and trade funds is to this AB 617 uh, Community Air Protection Program that y you've probably heard about. And I think that Martha um, referenced, that Juana referenced. I mean, it was a huge. Uh, uh, the state really worked, Jerry Brown really worked. Uh, to split the environmental justice community um, to get the renewal of the cap and trade program. And so when that came up and the environmental justice community was clearly making progress in um, hoping to defeat that, um, they put forward AB 617. And there's lots of stories to tell this, but that put forward in the first year, I think 250 million and about 200 million every year since then for grants to um, 
uh, priority disadvantaged communities um, in what what uh, was put forward as a democ uh, democratized kind of program where community would be in charge of the money. The money would go to the most impacted communities and be administered by the uh, air pollution districts in each of those regions. Those air districts are not known for being um, pillars of community participation or even uh, knowing how, where impacted communities are. I mean, I have stories about our leaders needing to guide air district uh, uh, investigators by the hand because they were afraid to come to our communities. I mean, this, it just goes on and on. Yeah, women who <laughs> were from Atoras and others who just said, yeah, you, this is where I live. Um, you need to come here to look at the pollution. So anyway, long storied history, but that's how the money got distributed. And we did get that the steering committees for each of those projects had to be community, uh, uh, majority community members, but still, um, each of those air districts is dominating the decision making. And it's, uh, I mean, th there's 20, 30, 40 million dollars that's going into these air districts for distribution. So it's real money. Um, but I think the communities are not having the say that they need to have. And last thing I'll say is, is the requirement is that they put together a community emission reduction plan which is a good thing, but the state has not provided enough direct guidance as to how those emission reductions have to occur and that they have to be real um, and they have to be measurable. And so all of that is still to be, uh, still to be done and we're gonna see if it, can, if it can happen, but you need really strong uh, requirements on the part, I, well, in our case, I think on the part of the state to empower community members to actually be in those decision making roles so that both things have to happen, I think, because it's not happening at the local uh, county or city or district level. Yep. Yes to all of that. <laughs> and Diane, I know you, you, you need to leave in um, three minutes or so. So maybe if, if anybody from the working group has any additional questions for Diane. Um, and obviously, we can keep the list going to, to follow up after the meeting. Um. Yeah, um, I want to jump in and um, thank you both and um, to Yana who left for, for joining. I'm originally from California, so I really especially appreciate the work that you all do. Um, uh, Rava also just put this in the chat, but the, the main question I was going to ask is how um, the the outcomes of the investments are tracked in um, California, if that's going well, if you have kind of lessons learned from that process. I'm sorry, can you say that? I, I missed that. Which process? I, I was typing an answer. <laughs> sorry, from just generally tracking, like, how these investments have been, investments in the communities we're talking about, um, how they've been going and, and how we're tracking whether they're you know, making a difference uh, or, yeah. Yeah, um, the, I actually just sent, well, you know, see, this is the thing, like, I would say where I see these investments, they're driving gentrification, right? They were used for smart growth. That's not what everybody would say. And then when you look at the data, I mean, we, we've done a really good job of giving you data, but, and I have it, I just don't know how to share it because it's not a, it's a PowerPoint. You know, we've got the data by by Senate district, by assembly district, right? Um, in terms of how much money was spent by, from the investment. So if that's what you want, that that's available, and that's actually mostly publicly available data. If you then want to know impact, that's different. Uh, and the impact I've seen has been both, um, you know, so the six one seven program, one of the grants in Los Angeles. I'm not kidding when I said the money went to Coca-Cola. The money is going to FedEx. The money is going to UPS. The bulk of it, right? And I, I, we've had to do a federal uh, Freedom of Information Act request on the South Coast Air Quality Management District because we want to know more. Well, where, how much of that is going to schools? What, you know, how, what are you doing about idling, right? We've got great rules in California, but they're not enforced. So. That's a harder question, and I think it would have been easier to answer had we done things like community-based grant making. Um, 
you know, if we would have done better if we did listen to the EJ community in our first set of recommendations that if you're going to, you know, deploy solar roofs, then you need community driven solutions and you need to do the barriers first. Like we need to fix people's roofs before they can put solar on them and we should have wraparound services. So there's no upfront cost, right? There were so many things that we left out of the, the regulations in terms of being focused on environmental justice from the original AB 32 stuff. So we keep building on that and it's, you know, it keeps not delivering actual emissions reductions because California's emissions aren't going down. So don't go down the road of just thinking about the money and how to distribute it. Um, think about how to lower emissions and distribute the health benefits first. Yeah, I would totally agree with everything Martha said. I, I also think that we're in a very um, interesting time uh, of when California adopts regulations or executive orders, like the governor's statement that we're gonna have all zero emission drayage trucks by 2035, um, that the assumption is that uh, the cap and trade money or any money will be used for um, incentives, that nobody can uh, comply with the regulation anymore unless there's incentives that go with it. So, uh, in the 617 process, community uh, steering committees in, at least in San Diego, have been put in this uh, terrible position of being forced to choose between community uh, projects and funding uh, major corporations to uh, transition to zero emission vehicles. Um, because these are the vehicles that are running through their communities and uh, that they definitely want to be less polluting but there's all these community needs that exist as well. So um, in large part, that's where the money's going, uh, is to transition for these large corporations that uh, you know, should be paying for it themselves. We've mostly staved off any near zero proposals that it has to be ZEV. I think the community's been firm about that, and I would highly recommend that you ensure that that happened. But, uh, but they're not going for some of the community uh, level projects that Marta described. And do we have any other questions for either Diane or, or Marta? I do um, have one, like if nobody else. Oh, sorry. Oh, go go ahead. ahead. So, you know, obviously, you. like what you're saying, this is this is so helpful. Um, and but really does raise like a lot of alarm bells for me, of course, right? And kind of, <laughs> but but I appreciate you, you, you know, helping us get out ahead of this. But so I wonder, and this goes back to a question I think Eddie posed in the chat earlier. Um, like if you could go back to the beginning, and do it all again, maybe like, what would you do differently? And specifically, I'm thinking, it's, you know, for myself, I keep thinking we want to invest in people, right? And like helping people. And so this is where I, I feel wary of the geographic based definition. So I, I, you know, just can you help me dig into that just a little further before you have to jump off? I'll, I guess I'll, you know, that's huge. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that in uh, uh, two minutes that I have left, but um, I, I I absolutely see the um, the challenges with a, a geography-based system, and we think our communities are pretty important, and they are geographic. So I think that we could have done better at inter in integrating other factors uh, besides geography. But the fact is that that's not, in my mind, not a bad determinant for how you identify communities um, that are most impacted because that's where the land use, um, discriminatory land use lands, it, it is by community. So you, 
in my view, you can't reject that um, completely. The other uh, criteria and indicators are critically important, um, and there has to be la it has to be layered. But um, you know, it has helped to bring community together. And one of the strategies that we've utilized is community-driven planning, and a way for communities to really own their communities and have power over them. So this does factor in, and uh, and I think. We just have to be cautious. So I, I know that's not a complete answer, but uh, but I think that uh, geography is working in in large part if it is accompanied by true community participation um, with with people obviously in the community who know what are the needs there. So I so apologize, and I am going to jump off <laughs> so I can get on this other call. But um, thank, you so thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diana. <laughs> Thank you. you know, I, I actually you, want to take a stab at that because we heard a lot of those kinds of questions at, at, in different, iterated in different ways throughout this process. And we actually often deal with that discomfort that you expressed when we're having policy debates with our, what I call our friends and our frenemies, right? Because as my other environmental justice leader says, are, you, are we all on the same train? Are we all on the train that says justice on the front of it, right? And sometimes we think we're on the same train, but we're not on the same train. What I would say about wanting to help everyone and why this is important is, you know, based on what Diane said, is that our communities, you know, are there. And we have to acknowledge that given how we have organized ourselves as a society, some people have borne, un, you know, have been underprotected and overexposed. And if you begin to solve that problem, right, we tend to like solutions that are at the top of the market because we're a market based society. If we flip that around and concentrate the benefits on the folks who felt the worst and solve those problems on the ground, such as, you know, clean production, real alternatives that move beyond extraction, right? Figuring out how our economy shifts from extraction to caring. Then, because that's what the people at the bottom need most, and we've seen that through COVID, then, you know, really everybody benefits. So it's the inverse of the trickled down, right? If you lay a groundwork where people are most impacted, which is at the level of community, and now we know that those, some communities are more impacted than others, you center there, and then you do help everybody. But in a way that's deeply rooted in justice, right? That the justice has to be at the center of it, has to be the first thought, you know, if you're a chemist, where's the justice chemical? You know, where's the justice molecule in the work of you're doing that you're doing? So, um, and when that's there, uh, I think that makes the case for more people benefiting from from it overall. Thank you, Marisa. Um so it looks like, do we have any other questions? I don't see any other hands raised. Oh, okay. yeah, I just, I just wanted to make a comment uh, for Malta before she steps out. First, I wanted to thank you so much. It's awesome to see you. Um, <laughs> but there's no way that you could. Way of predicting how government lobbyists and other interests will come into the space and undermine the work that we're doing. And I, and I think the lesson that I'm getting from what, what, you're, what you're saying is that if it is driven by the grassroots, by the front line, by community, local solutions, and we're rejecting false solutions and tech fixes, um, and we're also thinking about how resources are allocated, streamlining the way that those resources are allocated to make it easier for frontline communities to access them. I mean, I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is that we need to flip the way governance has operated in the past and really put uh, uh, racial justice and equity at the center. And so I, I really want to thank you for that um, and also for lifting displacement uh, because people often don't see displacement and climate connected to each other and it disrupts social cohesion. It really undermines what we're trying to do here. So de corazón, gracias, Malta. I really appreciate always seeing you. I don't know if anybody has any other comments, but I just wanted to share that. I don't have any additional comments except to say that I really echo everything that Elizabeth has said. Um, I think that everything that Martha 
uh, Yana and um, Diane brought to uh, today's conversation is so much of what many of us frontline leaders have been advocating for and know this because this is the work that we do in our communities and we are the we have the local knowledge and expertise in, in these communities and I just wanted to say that beyond just on the policy level is that I deeply, deeply feel this in my bones. And so I've really appreciated this conversation and I hope that you guys will return to um, have more conversations with us. Yes, and we are actually collecting some lessons learned and uh, to be able to share. And, you know, if we could travel, I would be in New York. And so any, you know, any way I can help and I'm an early riser. So this kind of thing is not so bad once I'm caffeinated. So it was wonderful to be with you all and, and thanks a lot. And we're here, so we can we you know let's let's do this right and better. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for your time, Marcia. So it, so it sounds like you know I, this conversation is one that probably could go on for another few hours. I think there's a lot more that we you know we can learn from the California experience. So you know thinking about kind of what the next you know few meetings look like. Um, I don't know what everyone thinks, but maybe we could think about how to schedule a follow up conversation um, with our colleagues from California and maybe a few other organizations that we could hear from as well um, as we as we think through the, you know, the implementation challenges uh, before us. So that that would be a, a great thing to, to put on our on our radar for the next um, the next meeting to discuss. And in fact, Chris, um, one last thing, what might be helpful, and, and, and I don't think, I, we all should have thought of this in advance. I, 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 I know I didn't until five minutes before the call. It'd probably be really helpful to kind of front load the questions to them in advance, uh, because one of the areas that's central to all of us is how do we do this direct funding, not but benefits, yes, mandate that we have. And it sounds like, um, Yana from the government side has a really complicated, and I feel for you, Chris, I know I saw the look on your face when she started talking about all the people that has to be tracking this. That's not the green jobs that we're talking about at the community level, but whatever. But if we're able to kind of, and, and th there's from the government side, then there's from the community side, like there's a lot of rich stuff that would be helpful to kind of give it to them in advance. So they, they, they came ready with PowerPoints, brother. So like we should at least like uh, try to take advantage of that next time. But th thank you. I think it's a, uh, I'd love to hear what the other panelists think, but I think uh, a future and more targeted uh, conversation would be really helpful for all of us. Yeah, it's almost it's almost like we need to, um, you know, kind of you know, prepare. I mean, and there's probably several, you know, topic oriented conversations we want to have. So um, if, if we could be more proactive in terms of scoping those out and then, yeah, preparing them uh, for that specific conversation, that that would be probably to our to our benefit to move through the. The, the tricky topics, um, but yeah, why don't we open it up for a few minutes here? Um, any other thoughts about how to proceed um, on this topic? I mean, so we have notes from this conversation. I think there's, you know, probably a few additional, you know, open questions that we might want to get into from from the conversation today. Um, you know, Yana had to leave, but one of the things I was interested in is, you know, had California thought about a path to incorporate the um, you know, the community data collection efforts um, to help supplement the, you know, the state or federal data sets that are available, you know, so, so there's probably a number of those sorts of questions that um, are still kind of outstanding that we, we can pull together, um, you know, for, for the next conversation, but anything else that folks want to make sure we cover in subsequent uh, conversations with, with California? Chris, this is Rawa. I don't know if it's like a sub subsequent conversation with California, but I really think that what I heard is the, the importance of being able to track uh, what the, whatever implementation strategy that New York is going to be using for these investments, but that has to be part of a tool that we create from the beginning and has to have like some kind of ongoing and kind of quick responses so that, and that whatever sort of implementation strategy that we have it has to be resilient to what those findings are so that we can pivot if we need to, to ensure that again, the investments are going to the most impacted people and communities. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just want to add uh, in support of what Rawa is saying that we also have to document these processes and show where the gaps and the problems, the pitfalls may exist. Um, look at what happened in California and learn um, the mistakes or, you know, maybe they didn't go as far as they would have liked to have gone because of some of the institutional culture um, and then identify ways that we're going to get past that. So, uh, being able to do it also is identifying what some of the, um, the challenges that exist within governance to prevent us to getting to getting to the, those places. So, uh, anyway, I just wanted to lift what she said. Thank you. Monica. Okay, so hey, if, hey, if Chris, no other... this is Neil. I just <clears throat> hey. Sorry. Sorry, I just had a quick question. Um, I, I was interested to hear a little bit more about um, the discussions they had about how to kind of summarize the data. Um, you know, there, there's all different kinds of ways to summarize the data, and I think they took a really straightforward approach. And I'd be interested to know a little bit more about um, if there was a lot of discussion around that. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe that they kind of um, settled on a plan right away. Um, but that that would be helpful to me. Got it. Thanks, Neil. Good point. Abby, Chris, looks like you're. Yeah. Can I ask a yeah. quick question? So, you know, what I got out of that was certainly that the geographic definition at the census tract level makes sense, which is good because that you know, that's what Alum is doing. So, yay. But that only if it's accompanied by this real community engagement in the process and decision making framework. So. As the climate justice working group, what can that be part of what we do, what we, we present to the Climate Action Council? Like that that piece of the recommendation above and beyond just the the DAC definition itself. And that's a question. Like <laughs> yeah, so so I so I think while you know while the, the law you know kind of speaks to you know this working group um, you know, being responsible for the, the, the development of the, the criteria, you know, I don't think there's a, you know, a reason why we shouldn't be also identifying, you know, kind of the, the other conditions or the other needs that might be necessary to successfully implement. So I think that's, that would be a good use of our time. And I don't know if Rosa's still on, but, um, but that's something, you know, we could talk about here as a, as a working group going forward, right? I think there's still, you know, some question that, you know, we have about, you know, beyond the definition of the, the disadvantaged uh, communities. Um, so what else, right? So we want to think about um, how best to keep the working group engaged and, you know, think through how we can, you know, successfully implement this. Thanks, Chris. That makes sense. And definitely going to keep that for our ongoing conversation so that you all can come up with those recommendations as a group. Um, do we oh, do we want to move forward? Oh, go ahead, Eddie. Oh, I'm sorry, one last question. I, it, it's, it's hysterical. Like I was typing something as Chris is saying it at the same real time. So this kind of Vulcan thing, mind meld is, is scaring me or should be scaring Chris. Uh -oh. is, here's my question. <laughs> and, and Rosa, you may have said this in previous meetings, but, but to Abby's question and, and Chris's response, can can one of you guys um, uh, share again the mandate of this group? Meaning, uh, at what point did the law envision the climate justice working group kind of phasing out? Right, like I think a lot of us are thinking, you know, or some of us may be thinking, okay, our job is done once we pass along the DAC uh, recommendations uh, to the Climate Action Council. But what I'm hearing is that there is there are roles or need beyond that submission that both the law, I think, originally intended for this working group to continue, but maybe as you guys have been thinking and talking internally at, at, at DEC and NYSERDA, what, what are you guys thinking and seeing of as the ongoing mandate, perhaps, of this working group? Or is it supposed to end and phase out once we do this job and, and send along recommendations to the council? I was trying yeah, to see if I had the slide available because okay. Chris, we did have that slide at one point. Um, but yeah. yes, there is this yeah. working group does have a role past when you come up with the final definition, and that includes in the future convening at least once to review 
um, how the definition is working. So it does include that check of, is there a way we can improve? Are there new data sets? Because remember uh, some of the things that Alex has been talking about is there are some things that we could have in the future, they're just not available to us right now in the way that we could use them. So there's definitely that role future looking for the working group. Hey, and Eddie, it's uh, Jared Snyder. I'd j just like to add there's a continuing role on the community air monitoring aspect of the, the CLCPA, um, which, you know, under the, the schedule, the CLCPA goes out 2022 to 2024. Um, so, you know, that, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to wait until then to get started. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, Jared. Um, Chris, this is so Jared Rosa, you, you were trying to, oh, hey, Jared, go, go ahead. Sorry, uh, this is more of a request if you're passing along requests to the California team for any future meetings, um, bringing it back to the, the discussion about our indigenous communities in the state. I would really like to see a summary of the listening sessions that they conducted with their communities in California, um, just to see and kind of compare and contrast um, you know, with some of the considerations that we may have in our own state. Just to tee it up for the Thanks, next Jerry. year. Or two. Thank you. Yeah, so, and to tie up this portion of the agenda, what, what we will do is um, we'll pull together um, a list. We'll start a list of follow-up questions and areas of inquiry for the California team and share that with the working group. So you, you can kind of add to it. Then we'll look to kind of, you know, um, you know, schedule, you know, at least one, if not a couple of additional follow-up conversations. Um, and, you know, we could work with Yana and, um, you know, think about, you know, if there are any other folks from the states that need to be involved as we think about like the implementation and the data side, um, you know, and then there may be some other stakeholders we, we um, value, you know, value um, you know, hearing from as well. So, you know, Rosa and I can kind of take that back and um, pull together, a, you know, a, an approach for kind of follow-up. With everyone. Okay, so should we move on the agenda? I know we're, we're running short on time here, so uh, maybe we can move to the next the next slide. Great. So okay, a couple this of, is just. Oh, go ahead, Chris. Sorry, Rosa. Yeah, I didn't well, have to keep going. Keep going. All right, we we didn't practice this, folks. Um, so. <laughs> In terms of the, the business and, and process items, um, um, we have a couple of uh, a couple of them on the uh, agenda for today. So the first is um, obviously you know, any reflections or follow up from the the last meeting that we had. Um, and just a reminder, we did speak about um, our approach for public engagement, um, and there was some good conversation about you know needing to make sure that we build in some educational opportunities. So whether you know we use some webinar or other format to you know, make sure people understand what we're doing um, and what we're trying to do before expecting them to provide um, you know, feedback on the, the draft criteria. Um, and then thinking about how we you know, kind of structure those meetings in terms of you know, being able to make sure we have enough time for public um, input. Um, so, you know, and then we also spoke about um, you know, indicators. So uh, Alex went through um, the snapshots that were being pulled together to kind of help you know help us better think through what what the indicators could mean, um, you know, in terms of you know sizing. And there's more to come on that today. Um, but um, any additional kind of reflection or or follow up based on the conversations last last meeting? And while we wait for that, do we have? Um, any comments on the uh, draft meeting minutes from from last time? Uh, Chris, if, Abby. So just um, so I was not at the last meeting, but I did watch the recording. And to I think it was Amy's point about um, you know for the public engagement meetings, not wanting to ask too much of people in terms of time. You know when it's like a three hour window to give public comment. I was just wondering what, what is possible for like telling people, at least within some kind of window, when they would be up for comment. Cause I know even for myself, 
when I signed up to give comment for something and it's like sometime in this two hours you will get be called upon. Is there a way to to let people know at least you know within this half an hour block is you know just so so we are making it easier for people? I would say that's something I think we need to think through a little bit more, but Rosa, I don't know from the DEC experience if, if there's anything that you would want to speak to on that front. You know, I'd have to investigate with our communications team if we have some tools like that, because a lot of times we know people register for the meetings, but we don't know or assign a time when they would be giving their comment. Uh, but it's something we could come back to. Thanks, so Abby, that's a that's a follow up on our end to uh, to bring back to our next meeting. Yep. Um, so can I get a, a motion to approve the the minutes from from last meeting? I move to approve the minutes from the last mini meeting. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, <laughs> a second. I reviewed them. So I'll I'll second. second them. Okay. Thank you, Jared. So those meetings are approved. Um, and um, let's let's move forward to the next agenda item, please. Okay, so um, I'll turn I'll turn the 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 platform over to Alex Dunn, who will talk through kind of where we are and the the process for kind of you know working through the indicators and and helping us get to a point where we're more comfortable with the data and um, how to use it. So, Alex, the floor is yours. Okay, I, I promise to behave myself and not like throw out more statsy terms uh, to give you more headaches on that. But I, we have done a lot in the last couple of weeks. So I wanted to share with you um, kind of with this diagram that we've been talking about. You know, we move from like moving and dealing with the indicators and the data and actually are now starting to combine things and look at things. Um, we're still obtaining some critical data. We're still working with some GIS transformations to be able to make sure that we get some of the critical data particularly those that are mentioned in the legislation. So we're working there. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, the reality one where we're looping back and forth right now, we're testing a bunch of stuff. Um, and because we're testing a lot of stuff, actually, we very critically need your opinion. So <clears throat> to Marta's um, perspective and, and knowledge of, are basically saying we need ground truthing. That's exactly what we're going to ask you all to do now. Um, so I've created this little map thing and um, we need to figure out how to like see whether our things are working and testing like together. And so that means we need your feedback. So um, yeah, to that point, we're creating right now a example kind of combinations of things of different criteria. And there's a lot to be dealing with at this point. Um, just the number of, of indicators that we put in, how we combine them together is all sorts of crazy. Um, and and it, it's, it makes things like so exponential, basically, you know, we choose these different criteria and then we multiply them together. We, you know, add them up into different groups and how do we do that? Um, in the previous work that we've done, we've been thinking about pillars because that's what's in the legislation. We've been talking about them this way. But what we found in the data is that um, there might be a better way for us to be thinking about the combinations or like the buckets of how we're combining things. So we wanted to share this with you, how we're pulling things together in the different ways. And, you know, so we've got threats and then we've got vulnerabilities here. <clears throat> um, and and I think this is actually kind of a nice way of doing it because we're, we're pulling in, you know, conditions and risk people face in the natural environment under the threats. And then we're pulling in the vulnerabilities, so the, the population characteristics and the health effects on the vulnerabilities side. Um, and so this crosses the pillars, but it doesn't in a really nice way. And, and part of when we were working through the pillars and trying to assign pillar, the indicators to pillars is we started seeing this mishmash happening. Like, well, is it pillar two or is it pillar three or, you know, those kind of things. This is a bit of a clearer bisection for us. Um, and what that means then is that we can start putting some indicators in the threats bucket and creating like this threats, you know, number per se estimate. And then we're creating a vulnerabilities number and estimate. And then it's like, okay, we have these two buckets. How do we combine them to make a final score or a final designation with criteria? 
So, you know, this is still a work in progress. Um, very, very much so, but I think it's, it's the right way for us to go. So we wanted to introduce this to you now. Um, uh, so that you can kind of just start thinking about it. And if you have any thoughts, I'd love to hear them. If you think this is a good way to go versus you want us to stick to pillars, let us know. Um, but right now, this is what we see with the data. Things are clumping in the, in these ways. So I'm pausing for dramatic effects slash comments. So if it's dramatic effects you want, let me go with it. <laughs> So Dr. Dunn, uh, I love this. I, I love uh, the pillars and I like the fact that you included in pillar two uh, structural racism and historical discrimination and historical ra racism, epigenetics. I mean, we really need to be able to identify and ground it in the history, not just of extraction, but of, uh, of racism, right? And so, mm -hmm. because we know that people are more susceptible to disease you know anything any 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 kind of crisis if 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 they're if they're black so um so naming it i think is really important so i, I want to thank you for that yeah. you're welcome uh eddie just a, a quick question so we you're and, and I'm, i also agree like i think this is this is a a, a really helpful way of 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 capturing and 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 um uh melding uh some of these things in a way that's useful for folks do you, you don't have any on, on the slides that you you were comparing this juxtaposed to the pillars and and i don't remember all the pillars do we we don't have a a slide for that do we or uh not right now but i think you can think okay. of pillar one and amanda can always correct me she's the one that really has been dealing with this so this is amanda's structure so give her props not me um, but, you know, pillar one is really about the kind of the pollution and the burdens and very en environmentally focused. And then pillar two is very much a kind of understanding the population um, and the characteristics, vulnerabilities from the population perspective. And then pillar three is this interesting one of, of kind of like population at risk due to environmental changes and climate change. And so that one was very murky and hard to kind of, it intersected with a lot of things, right? Um, Whereas I think this is a clear kind of combination of, of the pillars across most of the, the areas in a, in a way that, you know, yeah. makes sense. And I think- So it's really that... just, yeah, reorienting the legislative language that everything in the legislation is included, but we grouped it in this way that functionally um, makes it easier to think about and score communities um, by these factors. So if, if I'm sensing that this is a more digestible way, and I think that that's good. That's what we're seeing in the data. It's also how I think we're going to structure the um, the different numbers and how we put it together um, and the estimates of it. So I think if we're going to go down this road, if it if it breaks at some point, you know, we'll let you know. But this is our current working theory. Um, Elizabeth, to your point about the historical discrimination and the, those structural elements that I think are so critical, it was really hard. We've been trying to find data to show those different historical elements, and they're very, very hard to find, at least in any kind of consistent way. So New York City, I think, might have some better ways of doing it, but we're, we're trying to figure out whether some of the red line, like, some different indicators might be better than others for us to capture this. It's a work in progress, though. Um, and what I think one of the things to the California experience, we're going to create this tool, we're going to create this, this set of criteria, and it shouldn't be set in stone. Like it should be in that is also going to be some recommendations of we think this type of data is going to be important for us to track in the future and that it probably could be in integrated in. And some of that, I think, is actually tracking some of the historical elements. The other thing I want to say here is I'm actually hoping that we can get around this by using data we have and your experience and your ability to ground through some of this so that we can model it. So if you can tell me this is an area with a lot of historical discrimination, a lot of issues that um, are not captured in the data, then I can go, we can go look and say, okay, well, that census tract, how does that correlate? 
versus other census tracts. Like, what is it that I can find in the data and what patterns in the data that can then highlight that census tract for being an issue, like for being something where you want to definitely designate it a, a DAC. So does that make sense? Yeah, I'm having a little trouble with it, uh, Dr. Dunn, in the sense that you're saying that there's no data and maybe it's because of the way that I think about uh, the, the legacy of environmental racism and, and, and just racism, right? And, mm -hmm. and I think about where, where are the communities where there are ice raids, where there's displacement, where are the communities where there's high levels of police misconduct, where are the communities where, where children are put in segregated schools, you know, where mm -hmm. are the communities that have a history of all of that? And to me, all of that is documented. That, those are facts. Those are not anecdotal. That's not, you know, us talking about our lived experience. That's generational and that's documented. And so that becomes difficult for me. And then the other thing that's a challenge is, of course, one of the things that I mentioned before, that if you're a black person, you're more likely to be exposed to this stuff regardless of income. And so, mm -hmm. it, so, so the, it doesn't fit into neat little boxes. And so there needs to be Elizabeth, you cut out there for a minute. Oh, yeah, I, I was just saying that I do think that there is a lot of documentation that goes, I mean, I certainly, the stories are important, but the stories only capture a minute, our lifetime, and we're talking about history. Yeah, and to that point, I think, um, I hear you, they are documented, and maybe this is one of those areas where we can start thinking about that documentation and how we can gather those data and put it into this framework, right? Just like California had issues trying to figure out how to do the census track and what was in that census track. That's the part that's really messing with us. And so that's why we have some GIS transformations happening for some of those critical data points. But you're absolutely right. Those data are there. They're just not consistently tracked across the whole state. And that is one of the things I'm really worried about, right? So if those data are tracked in certain places, how do we figure out how to integrate those versus not? Um, what I don't want to happen is to like create this beautiful tool that works for everywhere but doesn't actually capture reality. So that I think it's a really good point. By the way, and I want to say this very clearly, I don't think having been a Californian before an Oregonian, um, the race issue was a big issue in all research in California. I'm so thankful it's not in New York because we can actually have race and do have race currently in our models. And it is one of the biggest, most important predictors that we have. So we thankfully don't have to do an end run around there. And then I think there are some areas and I don't know whether it can happen right away for this first one, but I think that we need to start looking at some of the shifts in census, uh, shifts in historical data um, that we can get at. So that that is my hope to get at some of this underlying racism and um, segregation issues that we're not currently capturing. So I hear you. It's um, it's just it's it's not consistent, even though it is tracked. And that is the part that I want to make sure we capture it. So keep saying it and I will hear it and we are working toward it. Um, it's just hard to get the data in the form we need right now, but we're working on it. Thank you. Okay, so we've got this new framework. We're very happy about it. Um, <clears throat> the next thing, oh, let's see, here we go. The next thing we really need from you, and I had teed this up with mentioning it before that we were going to give you some examples and I wanted you to ground truth it. But what we realized is that um, we're getting, we have so many different potential models that before we want to give you like 24 different things for you to assess, we actually just need a quick way of verifying for ourselves that this is a good solution or a good enough solution to then give to you guys to do more. So what I'd really like to ask for you is to give us a list of census tracts that you think you that you with your experience in the communities that you represent are disadvantaged communities and then a list of ones that you think should definitely not be like that you worry that could be based on how things are being talked about but should absolutely not be um, and then the reasons you chose that so I created this tool 
this this website now that we have um and it is the world's most basic map of new york state and i'm gonna give you a bit of a, a way of show you like i'll show you so let me stop sharing this and then i'm gonna share with you my map okay oh come on where are you i'll just share this screen come on there you go okay and come on no go back okay the world is not working for me right now here we go it's gonna happen okay does everyone see this map yeah. cool okay so um we're going to be using this tool called tableau um and we're going to continue to use it so this is your first experience with it but um what i have here is a basic map with census tracts in it and what i'm going to ask you to do is to tinker with this map and zoom into different places so someone tell me where to go just uh, give me a name of a town. Bronx. Area. Okay. And uh, I'm gonna tell you this... right now. I'm gonna tell you right now. Riverdale should not be a disadvantaged community in the South Bronx. Yes. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm anticipating and so keep going, Alex. Sorry. Okay. I'm gonna put Riverdale in. <laughs> And oh no, is it going to take me to New Jersey? It's taking me to New Jersey. That did not work. <laughs> okay, let's try Bronx. Okay, that works. That works. That's way better. Come back. Come back to me. Okay, so here we have um, New York and different areas. And what you can do now is hover over different parts. Oh, let's look at Manhattan talking about places that should not be a DAC. Here we go. Um, we'll, what you'll see is a geo ID. And what I want you to do is write down the geo ID of the places that you think are DACs and the geo ID of places that you don't think are, um, that you think might be accidentally identified that way. And for the regions that you represent, I think that this is a really important thing to do. So you can zoom in a lot. Um, or you can zoom in or zoom out a lot. It's up to you. But what I wanted to give you was a tool that would help you target different areas. <clears throat> and then we will take those GOIDs and this is like the first mini ground truthing thing that we can do. So once we get those data from you, then we're like, okay. Cause literally there's some models that we have that have like barely any overlap with the same indicators. It's just how you put it all together. It's crazy. So we really need this from you guys to be able to then um, say like, oh, well this model has everything in here or it has like eight out of the 10 that everyone's been giving us. Um, and this other model has two out of the 10. Well, clearly that approach of combining things is wrong, or at least not what we want to use. So this is where we're going to go. Anyone else want to shout out so I, I can show off the cool tool? OK, I'm, I'm going to Nyserta. We're the B sisters, uh, Brooklyn, Buffalo. Y'all ain't throwing your towns in? Come on. Hey, you, th you threw in the Bronx and we're standing in solidarity with our people in the Bronx. So we got, we, <laughs> it's all love. You can be real specific and go down to Simpson Street, <laughs> where I lived as a kid. <laughs> See, you, know? you guys know this stuff. This is awesome. This is what we need. We need your, your lived experience in this. Um, so again, you can zoom in and zoom out as much as you want. You can hover over different parts. Um, <clears throat> but we really need to hear from you on this. So this is the tool. Um, it is in the PowerPoint. The link in there is in the PowerPoint. And I want to come back to the PowerPoint because we want this. And what we thought was this little table where basically you have the, the number, that crazy number, which, by the way, is how the United States Census decide to name census tracts. Um, whether you think it should be a DAC or not, and then just a phrase or a sentence of why. This phrase or sentence of why is actually really critical to us, right? So 
it lends us to understand what are the main things that you're thinking of here that could be, you know, it's gentrified or um, it has a high historical, like just has a, a high pollution place, you know, placements. Me and words right now, not working. But you know what I mean? This will then give us a chance to assess, okay, well, when we see this tract as a DAC, and here's the explanation that you give us and what we see with the the different data in there, like, is that aligning? So it just gives us one more place to ground truth and make sure that we're getting it right. Um, aim to four to 10, you can like go through the whole state if you want, but that's a lot of census tracts. It's like 4,000, so don't do it. Um, <clears throat> but it will be the biggest thing. Right now we're kind of stalled out in trying to assess things because we don't have this ground truth method. And, and so then we would be using imperfect, um, how can I put this, imperfect tools to assess something like just using LMI um, or the previous um, interim DAC approach. And those clearly aren't good enough or we wouldn't be here. So this is why we want you. Have I sold it enough? Okay. Because that's that's basically where we're at. We have five minutes to spare. Talk about amazing timing. That was all I wanted to talk about. Um, but we are running with this, and it's it's really great to see how much we've managed to put together and integrate. Amanda has created this really cool tool that we can kind of like take, take off little things and then see it. Um, so the next step is is for you guys to get us that. If you can get us that in a week then I'm hoping that we can present some of our findings in the next working group meetings in a couple weeks. Alex, I guess maybe for folks that might have an issue with the link in the PowerPoint, you know, we could send out a, a link in an email um, mm -hmm. after the meeting, just so, you know, we don't have to kind of open up that massive PowerPoint and, and kind of find it. Um, and then I guess in terms of if anybody has any issue kind of with the table or anything like that, we could also just throw our template together and, and you know, you just fill that out. Yeah. And if you can just email this to Rosa and me, I mean, like, it doesn't have to be super formal and it, it doesn't have to be in the table, but literally we just want to be able to, to track it. So if you have a, these are the DACs, here's why we think these are important. And then here's the ones we definitely think are not, here's why, that's all we need. Okay. Okay, so, and in, in just Alex, to be clear, we're asking for um, folks to do what they can in the next week, so, you know, end of next week, get a get an email back over to Alex and Rosa with um, yeah, yeah, the 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 census tracks that you think are are DAX. Yeah, I will po politely send out reminders or ask Rosa to do so if we're not getting it because it is the critical point where we need it to to get a little bit more information. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have three minutes here, and maybe just to kind of recap um, our next steps. So we do have a meeting scheduled for the 24th uh, from 2 to 4, so that should be on your calendars. If not, uh, let, it, let us know. Um, based on the conversation today with California, um, the DEC and I started a team will pull together um, uh, a list of, of open questions or follow-up questions um, and distribute that with, to the working group so that way we could start to build out you know, um, kind of the, the discussion points for the for follow up conversations with California. We'll also kind of think about how to structure those follow up conversations. You know, um, clearly an hour is not enough time um, to to really have a conversation. So, um, so we'll kind of think about how best to do that. Um, and then, you know, the conversation on recommendations and kind of like the life of the working group going forward. So, you know, Jared, you know, made it clear there there are other responsibilities that the working group has. Um, but um, we'll also kind of think through how to, um, you know, kind of pull together kind of recommendations for kind of the implementation, you know, kind of phase of the, the CLCPA. Um, okay, any other next steps, Alex, on your end or, or Rosa, if you're still on? 
Uh, no, uh, we will email the link so you can you will see that from an email from Rosa um, after this meeting, and I think we all can say how important it was to have that meeting with California, and I hope we have more. We've spoken with Yana before for some of the data stuff, but to have everyone there is huge. Okay, so um, thank you all and thanks for the for the time today. Um, hopefully you can go have a few lunch before your next meeting. Um, but have a great weekend. Thank you all. Peace everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Have a great weekend.